Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our live Dhamma. Going back to the ocean again. The ocean has one taste, the taste of salt. And the Dhamma has but one taste, and that is the taste of freedom. Tonight I thought I'd talk a little bit more about freedom. Freedom's interesting. It's interesting how we approach freedom. There are three ways of speaking about freedom. We speak of freedom from, we speak of freedom to, and we speak of some ambiguous freedom of, or general freedom of. So freedom of is the type of freedom. But the interesting, it gets interesting when we talk about freedom from and freedom to. Too often freedom is phrased in terms of freedom to. Too often because There's no, there's not really, it's not really freedom. When you talk about freedom too, you're not actually emphasizing the freedom. Freedom too is still freedom from. Right? Freedom from something, freedom from obstruction. But when you phrase it like that, the emphasis isn't actually on the freedom. The emphasis is on is on the ambition. It's on the desire or the inclination. We miss that because in order to be free to do something. You need to be free from something else. And, and, and there's an important, really, it's really an important distinction. In Buddhism, we're not really concerned about the freedom to. Freedom to implies some sort of desire or inclination or need. do something yeah. freedom to say what you want right? freedom to do what you want it's all about what we want it's not actually about the freedom and we miss that we go beyond the freedom and into the ambition which Interestingly enough, is not freedom at all. It's the freedom of the, uh, the the tar baby. You know the tar baby, the story of the tar baby. I don't know where what the origin of the story. I heard it with a rabbit. There was this cartoon rabbit, and it had a real. It's a real sort of cocky rabbit, and it, uh, so they they made this this uh, caricature out of tar. I think this is actually even in the commentaries, or maybe even the Buddha used this example. And so this rabbit comes up to the tar baby and attacks it, because the the tar baby won't speak to him, so he. He punches it. And when he punches it, he gets his fist stuck. Uh, 
And so then he tries to get his first fist out and gets his second fist stuck. And then he uses his feet to try to get his hands out and eventually he gets completely stuck and is carried away by the hunter. I think the Buddha used this example of a hunter. He uses this tar figure to catch a monkey maybe. Why that that relates to freedom too is because if you look at the Buddhist cosmology, the understanding of the way the world works, it becomes quite clear this whole existence we have, our whole life as human beings and the society we've built up is just us getting further and further ensnared. All of this liberty, freedom too, that's the exact opposite of freedom. Freedom to... It's freedom to go in debt. Freedom to become indentured. Freedom to commit. Freedom to get married to people, to your work, to your society. Freedom to be born into a society where, with laws and rules and culture man is born free and everywhere he is in chains Jean-Jacques Rousseau said this I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to but it's quite true We were born without much of any kind of uh, commitment or requirement and then we go about our whole lives enslaving ourselves. Okay, even, even just being born, it's not without slavery. We're slaves to hunger and thirst. We're never free from hunger or thirst or the need to urinate or defecate, to breathe. Our desires for sexual activity, our desires for romance, our desires for friendship, companionship, entertainment, appreciation, pride, the list goes on and on. Accomplishment, ambition, All of this freedom too, you know, that's the American dream. The America is so funny, we, everyone picks on America, but it's all that America stands for, is this enslavement. America is the land of the free, free to enslave yourself further and further into the depths and the dredges of samsara. That's what America was built on, right? Get away from the constraints, do what you want, live like a cowboy get further and further enmeshed in the web of samsara. That's not freedom. Freedom too is not freedom at all. It's freedom from. Because there is so much, so much that holds us back, that keeps us tied down. Freedom from suffering. But to be free from suffering, you need freedom from defilement. You need freedom from ignorance to be free from defilement. So the Buddha is very much about what we have to be free from. Free from samsara. It's the hardest kind of freedom. It's much easier to fight for your freedom to do things than it is to be free from. Fight for your rights. You see how hard that is? It's much harder to be free from. To be free from defilement, to be free from suffering. 
on the one hand, I guess on the other hand, it could even be argued that it's much easier. It's much more, much more attainable. Because you cannot always be free to do what you want. You can fight for it and work for it. And if not in this life, then in the next, you'll be able to attain your goals. But it can't last forever. You can be happier for days, weeks, months, years. It is possible to be quite happy most of the time, for a time. To get what you want most of the time. Some people are able for a time. But it doesn't last. It's not permanent or stable. It's dependent on conditions and causes and ambitions and it's dependent on work. But freedom from, freedom from is such a powerful thing and the, the Dhamma is such a powerful force to be able to deliver this very simple, simple state of freedom. This is why meditation is so free from accoutrements, it's so, fr so free from complication. Meditation is quite simple, really, right? When we hear about the meditation practice, it sounds kind of stupid, really. Why should I sit there and say to myself, pain, pain? What the heck is that going to do, right? We've got, we've got complex ideas about how to fix things. We've got, we're ambitious about it. But if you want to be free, you have to be free here and now. You have to be free, free in jail. Being free in Buddhism is like being free in jail. Prison's interesting because you have the prisoners on the inside and then you have the guards that keep them in but the guards are as much a prisoner as the prisoner in a sense the guards are required to come back every day the guards are required to work the guards are required to worry and care and and the prisoners are actually quite free they don't have to do anything you know they eat they have food brought to them and they eat they have no worries or stresses well in prison there are Prisons nowadays are quite terrible places full of evil, evil people who, not evil, evil people, but full of poor conditions and, and it, they make, it makes people evil and crazy. But it's interesting because it's not even so much that the people who go to prison are evil, it's that when you put people together like that and treat them like animals, because they're not free Because they're not free from defilement It's like a pressure cooker You build up the pressure and it explodes People out of fear and worry and Attachment Will go crazy in such an environment And so there's a lot of wickedness that comes out that is bred in prison but ostensibly, prison is quite peaceful, right? The concept of it. There's so much suffering in prison and evil in prison because, because people in prison aren't don't don't know how to be free. I had one when I was teaching in the federal detention center in Los Angeles. I had one meditator ask me if he could if I could teach him how to meditate to to levitate and to fly away. I said it was a it's quite clever of him to think of that. I said, no, that's not what I teach, and that's not true freedom. That wouldn't make him free. So there have been stories of prisoners successfully conducting meditation courses and finding great freedom. I mean, there's nothing terrible about prison ostensibly. Your requirements, it's a lot bit like being a monk you, know? you just have to come and eat I don't know what else you have to eat What else is required of you? 
I guess if you don't eat, you could stop eating, but uh, you have to eat. That's what I'd eat and sleep. Maybe there are chores to do in prison, I'm not sure. Yeah, no prison is a horrible place, but the concept of a prison. I guess it's only horrible when, when we hear about it in places like America where it's for profit and not just for profit, but um, where there's over-incarceration. Here in other countries, prison is quite peaceful and does its job in rehabilitating Canada as well as horrible prison system apparently. But the point is you can be you can be free in a prison theoretically. So our practice of meditation is it's not about allowing us to do this or do that. It's about freeing us from stress and suffering. And so it's such a torture to sit and meditate sometimes. It's a torture because we're not free. And so the 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 instinct is to get up and stop, right? To free yourself from the burden of having to meditate. It's keeping you from doing what you want, right? This freedom to, if I meditate, I'm not free to do what I want. I'm not free to follow my cravings. We meditate to free ourselves from craving, right? To free ourselves from the need to do things. So. Is an enlightened person free or free in no, as an enlightened person has is their freedom restricted in prison? Right? Can you restrict the freedom of a of an enlightened being? You can bind their hands and feet, put duct tape over their mouth, you can blindfold them, but you can't take away their freedom. Because it's not freedom to, it's freedom from. And so meditation is free from When we meditate and when we say to ourselves Pain, pain We're freeing ourselves from the baggage That we carry around about pain When we say seeing We're, we're freeing ourselves from the baggage Of liking and disliking And, and all that leads to ambition and, and, and inclination Judgment When we think, when we say thinking, thinking, we're reminding ourselves that it's only thinking, keeping ourselves free from views and beliefs and ideas and rationalization and so on, keeping our mind pure. Cultivating a pure mind. And eventually the greatest freedom that comes is when we do this, then eventually we start to see and we come free from the greatest bind of all, and that's ignorance. We become free from, from ignorance and delusion. Ignorance which prevents us from seeing right and wrong and good and bad, and delusion which mistakes right for wrong and good for bad and sets us on the wrong course and gets us mixed up sometimes good, sometimes bad and gets us caught more and more up in the web so there you go, just some brief thoughts on freedom and that's the Dhamma for tonight Do we have any questions? There's a couple on the site. Bhante, formal meditation understandably is clearer than when practicing in normal life. Are there any thoughts to facilitate clarity and mindfulness in everyday life like developing agility and shifting? There are so many things happening quickly Unlike in formal practice I want uh, 
I don't know these questions. I mean, this I get this kind of question a lot. What can you tell me that's going to make my practice easier? I mean, it's not easy. Yes, it's much more difficult in daily life. I don't have any. I mean, I could give you tips if you want, pointers, but it's all the same. Really, the best thing to do is to do a lot of intensive formal meditation so it becomes ingrained as a habit. You know, it's like asking... It's like saying when when you when you train as a boxer, hitting the punching bag, it's quite easy. You know, or when you train against a, you know, a person holding up those pads, it's quite easy. Now, do you have any tips for me when I actually go out into the boxing ring? Now, I mean, being in the boxing ring, like being in real life, is not like punching a punching bag or meditating formally. It's much more difficult. So, you know, the training is very, very important. Um, and I guess another thing is training in life as well. Training to see the difference, that in real life it's more complicated. And that's sort of what you're saying, you know. And to, to you know, train in that. So part of boxing is actually training in the ring. So, you know. I mean, the only answer I have for you is work, 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 train, 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 practice, practice, practice. How does one know for certain if I'm clinging to something real within myself or something created in the imagination, such as a feeling or thought created externally? That's an interesting question. I think you have a, interest, a strange understanding of the idea of real. What is real for you? It sounds like you have an idea that there exist real things, real entities. We don't have that idea in Buddhism. Real is experience. If you experience something, the experience is real. It doesn't matter whether you think of it as fake. Like, if you hear a noise, uh, it doesn't matter whether it was really caused by your eardrum vibrating or whether it was created in the mind. It's still sound. If you see an image, it doesn't matter whether you have your eyes closed or whether you actually see it on the, in the world around you. How would one go about having an insect like a tick removed from your skin in a benevolent manner? Well, there are ways. I mean, dealing with insects, ticks aren't that bad. Ticks, um, apparent, a really interesting thing is wet a washcloth, put it on the tick, and rotate it. R rub the cloth in, the wet cloth in circles. Just water. And by rubbing it in circles, I think it was cloth, the, the, you know, the tick eventually um, retracts itself. You just keep rubbing in circles. Apparently that works. There was a YouTube video about that. And we had ticks in, uh, in, in when I was in Manitoba. But there are other ways. I mean, the bigger problem might be like a tapeworm. What would you do about a tapeworm? That would be interesting. I'm not really sure. Okay, we got some local questions there as well. What's this? Hmm. These Second Life talks aren't live streamed. They're not live streamed on YouTube. They are uploaded later, but there's an audio live stream if you want to read the audio. Yes, so someone asked, someone put that up. What's the cause of shyness? Shyness. Fear. Fear, which is anger-based. I mean, anger, it's aversion-based. You're averse to certain consequences. Some people are shy because they're afraid of violence or repercussions of, of interaction and so on. Shyness is sort of a fear. What's the cause? It's, you know, habit. Having, you know, you develop habits for the strangest reasons, but we develop them over lifetimes. Our habits sometimes just grow out of the smallest thing and they become obsessions and they can become very strong. The sh shyness can even become quite painful, but it's just a habit that builds up. 
Why wouldn't we focus on and appreciate the freedom to choose our religion, our tradition, our teacher, our practice, the freedom to accept precepts, be moral, make good choices, etc.? Well, that's not freedom. It's not. I mean, it, it is freedom, but it's it's not freedom to. It's freedom from. You're being free from uh, some external force, but no one can force you to. People can can control you externally. So freedom from physical control is is something I you know I didn't really touch upon. Or I you know kind of the, the idea of a prison. A prison is is control. You're being oppressed. You're being controlled by something external. But ultimately, it's it's insignificant. It's significant practically, but it's insignificant in an ultimate sense. It's not. It's not true. Um, imprisonment. You know I mean, but 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 it's that. It's still. It's still. We're still talking about uh, imprisonment by, which means lack of freedom from oppression. So if you're not free to choose your religion, it's because what well, the freedom part is actually because or if you're if you're free to choose your religion, it's freedom from oppression, freedom from someone forcing you into a certain religion, but of course you can't be forced into a religion. We're coerced and tricked and so on, tricked into thinking we we you know, we have to do this and have to do that. Someone holds a knife to your throat or a gun to your head and tells you, and they're tricking you into thinking that somehow you should convert to their religion or die. You know, when in fact, if you understood the truth, you'd just let them pull the trigger. Or yeah, you wouldn't have any reason to fear death if you were enlightened. So when you talk about choosing a religion... That's your desire, and, and it's, a, it's a different thing. I mean, when you have right intentions, it's not freedom. It's it's a it's actually a, a, a imprisonment. You're imprisoned by your right intentions. You, you're imprisoned by wisdom. You're controlled by wisdom. A person who is wise can't make bad choices. They're unable to. They they lack they lack the freedom from the, the control of wisdom, right? So I think it's interesting that we, we talk about freedom too when the two part isn't really about freedom. It's it, the focus is on our ambitions. You know, describing how you're free to do something isn't actually describing your freedom. It's roundabout. It's missing the point that freedom is always freedom from. And so, with with the, your examples, there, you know, those are good example, good things, but. Uh, well, you know, too often we're excited and 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 uh, joy overjoyed by the fact that we can do this and can do that. The power to uh, the power today of instant gratification to get what we want when we want it. So intoxicating this power. It's not freedom. Uh, it's very dangerous power. You know, that kind of "Quote unquote freedom." You know, the freedom part is great, fine, but the fact that we want to do all those things is very dangerous. So we miss the distinction. Yes, it's great to be free from oppression and and poverty and so on, but just because you're free from poverty by having lots of money doesn't mean you should go out and do whatever you want. Right? We, it's that that leap that we make just because you're free from Constraint means you should act upon the freed impulsions. Isn't there a certain shyness called hiri? No, that's not shyness. It's uh, it's not how we use the word shy in English. Hiri and Otaba are interesting words. I mean, they really do mean fear and shame, but they can't be either fear or shame because both fear and shame are, are unwholesome. So they're what stands in place. A good person appears to be ashamed of evil deeds, and they appear to be afraid of the consequences of evil deeds. But it's not fear and it's not shame. It's just 
the disinclination to do bad deeds Both because of the nature of the deeds Which is otapa and, and the cause Or the, sorry, the result Which is hiri I think most think of that as a blessing though To make great choices naturally Yes, but it is, yes, it is a blessing But it has nothing to do with freedom it's your inclination, it's your power, the greatness of mind You're not free to do all sorts of good things Evil people can't do them You're lucky if anything You're good, a good person Is inclined I think, I'm not actually quite sure what you're referring to But anyway There you go there's the Dhamma according to Yutta Dhamma Yutta Dhammo That's our session for tonight Thank you all for coming Have a good night